Omar Dejani, and it's uh, a great pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, uh, and uh, also a great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity for the conversation we're about to have, uh, which we hope will be um, a fairly uh, free-flowing and wide-ranging conversation um, about uh, some of the issues that Chris touched on uh, during the course of his opening remarks and many of the questions that Linda has uh, reflected on in her uh, uh, contribution, scholarly contributions, um, and contributions as a professor in this, in this field. I'd like to begin uh, just very quickly by identifying the panelists um, uh, that you see up here, uh, since I won't be able to do justice in the time that we have um, to their biographies. Uh, but the good news is that you can find their full biographies uh, in uh, the pamphlet for the, uh, the symposium. And so um, I think I'll start from the left and work to the right. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's just uh, figuratively uh, or <laughs> um, um, On our left, we have. They may need to rearrange the yes. <laughs> Uh, on our left, we have uh, Judge Fausto Pucar, um, who has served uh, as a judge in the Appeals Chamber in the International Criminal Tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and is also a professor at the University of Milan. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor John Kerry Sims, um, who's here at the George School of Law. Uh, we are very glad uh, that we not only have lawyers, but also an anthropologist on the panel, Lee Swigert. Um, who is a uh, director of programs in international justice and society at the um, International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life at Brandeis University. Uh, we have Beth Van Skak, who is uh, a Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor of Human Rights at Stanford uh, this year and is also a professor at Santa Clara School of Law. And then turning over to this side of the table, um, <laughs> uh, my colleague Steve McCaffrey, uh, who is a distinguished professor of law here at Nick George, and who was um, falsely uh, billed as also appearing on a panel this afternoon. Um, uh, hands off of Steve. <laughs> uh, I think it was clearly, clearly wishful thinking on the afternoon panel's uh, part. Um, uh, but Steve, uh, because he's he's headed to Amazonia tomorrow uh, to uh, to remake uh, one of the films that's been nominated for an Oscar. Uh, so, uh, we, can't, we can't hold him here too long. Uh, we have uh, Charles Jallop, who um, is an associate professor uh, over at Florida International University School of Law, and um, finally we have uh, Mark Ellis who is executive director of the International Bar Association. So um, wonderfully exciting um, and diverse group of panelists, and hopefully um, also an exciting and diverse uh, array of topics. Our aim in the first half of this conversation, which will go until around uh, uh, 11 o'clock, I think, is that right, um, is uh, to uh, discuss some of the individual components of what we are calling the international criminal justice system um, and the challenges that are presented uh, to the functioning of each of them, as well as to some extent to their interaction, with a view toward um, in the afternoon, uh, excuse me, not in the afternoon, at 11.20, and with John Kerry Sims uh, more capable um, uh, if in moderate moderation, um, uh, a conversation about the extent to which these disparate parts um, actually can be called a system, um, whether what we have here is a whole that is more than the sum of its parts. So um, at the outset, uh, we thought it would be interesting to begin by discussing the normative framework that's um, guiding this area of law. Um, and uh, as you all know, um, the normative framework that exists is to a very significant extent a reflection of the atrocities that shaped it in the 20th century. And one of the aims in the first part of the conversation um, is to explore um, to what extent that normative framework is evolving. Uh, now to get us started, I'd like to turn to my colleague, uh, Steve McCaffrey, uh, 
And Steve, could you talk a little bit about the um, origins of public international criminal law? Um, uh, in your view, uh, which previous attempts to establish uh, such norms um, have been most influential? Thank you, Omar, very much, and thank you for your kind introduction. I just want to begin by saying how happy I am to be here at this uh, conference celebrating Linda's many contributions to the field. Um, she started out as more or less a pure, purely domestic and not, very- not more or less. <laughs> sure, you I mean, can be more or less pure. <laughs> Ask Chris. The domestic criminal uh, law expert, uh, and a very good one, uh, and then made the transition to something that is actually, to my way of thinking, entirely different. It's kind of like me going from scholarship to farming, which I, I, I'm still trying to do. Uh, yeah. uh, sometimes with disastrous consequences. But in any event. Uh, For your scholarship or the plant? <laughs> <laughs> it involves tractors, you know, <laughs> teachers, things like that. <laughs> In any event, I'm, I'm so happy that we are gathered together to uh, have this meeting and, and think about the many things that Linda has been grappling with, both uh, in her activities and in her scholarship. Uh, so my own perspective on this comes from my stint on the International Law Commission from 1991 to 19, uh, 1981. Um, when the commission was grappling with something called the Draft Code of Crimes Against the Peace and Security of China. And uh, I had the uh, effrontery uh, in one of my first interventions in the commission, uh, you know, and they, they actually call it the maiden speech. <laughs> at, at the time, we had no women on the commission. Um, to to ask the question, what public international law, I'm glad, Omar, that you used that expression, what that has to do with individual criminal responsibility? How can an individual be responsible under public international law? Because international law, as a term connotes, deals with their relations among nations. How, how did the individual work its way, his or her way, into that. And I just want to say a few words, and I know you'll be kind enough to, to the audience to cut me off uh, <laughs> when I'm done. Uh, about where this seems to have come from. Uh, you know, we think about Nuremberg. The Nuremberg principles uh, were adopted by the International Law Commission in 1950, at the second session. Uh, and famously, they proclaimed that any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is responsible, therefore, and liable to punishment, okay? And the commission explains this in its commentary, but what it comes down to is that it quotes the Nuremberg judgment. And it says, well, this is true because uh, crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract enemies, and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provision of international law, provision, yeah, provision of international law be enforced. Really? Uh, I mean, how did individuals get in there? Other than pirates, I mean, of course, pirates. Yeah, our hostus <laughs> humani generis, the enemy of all mankind, you know, since time immemorial. Uh, we have thought of piracy as being what we would call now a universal offense, right? Subject to universal jurisdiction, whoever can grab the pirate can, can do whatever with uh, him, usually. Uh, so where did these Nuremberg principles come from? Well, in 1947, the General Assembly of the United Nations directed the International Law Commission, the ILC, to formulate the principles of international law recognized by the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal and in the judgment of the tribunal. Okay, think about that for a minute. It seems a bit extraordinary because 
it seems to put the cart before the horse, right? And later commentaries have, the commentators have said as much. So essentially, uh, we're saying as an international society, do what needs to be done, namely hang the offenders. And we'll make up the justification later. Uh, that seems to have been, you know, the General Assembly says, whoa, uh, we got to come up with something here that demonstrates that what we did in our is okay. So uh, we have, of course, ample historical uh, 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 documentation of the philosophy of war itself, whether it's permissible to go to war, what you can do or not do within war. Uh, you can go back to Cicero, and I'm sure even before Cicero, Vittoria, uh, Grotius, with his theories of just war, and then just war, and so forth. Um, but that's war between countries. Uh, Henri Dunant, the famous Swiss uh, humanitarian, um, of course, did inject the individual into the picture in the mid uh, 19th century because of his having been horrified by the way uh, the wounded really were treated in battle. Uh, but the individual really doesn't come up much and in that case it's the countries, again, it's a state to state thing that uh, is going on. You're not really looking at the individuals. It took the horrors, and this is a term that Chris Blakesley used, uh, of the First World War to reverse the basic paradigm, which was that the right to go to war is an attribute of sovereignty. Uh, and, and this paradigm was essentially reversed in the Covenant of the League of Nations, uh, which established this new international order in which war was outlawed and aggression was condemned. But not only that, the first, we really have the First World War to thank for a lot uh, because the revulsion at the horrors of that conflict was so great uh, that the international community agreed in the Treaty of Versailles, Article 227, to quote, publicly arraign Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany for a supreme offense against the international morality and, sanct and the sanctity of treaties. The supreme, uh, supreme offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. So here you have an individual committing an offense against the sanctity of treaties, but also against international morality. Um, OK. Well, I, I mean, just doing a little research to prepare this talk, I, I stumbled on that. And I hadn't even realized that it happened. Well, why hadn't I realized it, or why don't most people realize it? Because uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was uh, in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands wouldn't cough him up, basically. And so this became a dead letter. The trial never happened, uh, which, again, harks back to what Chris was saying about the situation we have in the world today. Right? Um, so what happened? The commission was established on the responsibility of the authors of war and on enforcement of penalties. Uh, and fine, OK? This is under the auspices of the League of Nations. But no agreement uh, was reached among the victorious powers on the question of establishing a tribunal for the trial of these folks which actually became kind of a, a theme. Um, it did, however, presage the establishment of the Nuremberg Tribunal after the Second World War. So in other words, the international community had sort of tasted this idea. And um, I don't want to mix metaphors too much. But anyway, it had tasted the idea. And, and perhaps that taste lingered. Uh, and uh, made it easier the next time around to establish a tribunal. Who knows? But, but you can kind of see perhaps where I'm 
where I'm going with this, uh, and it, it relates to the ICC. Um, maybe, since we started after the First World War, then after the Second World War, we had a, a tribunal that was uh, quite effective in punishing the major war criminals, uh, but it was a flawed tribunal, of course, because while it said that all of these offenses, in fact, in the judgment, it stated that all of the, the law that the tribunal applied uh, had been recognized, had been long recognized by the international community. It's hard to find evidence of that, not that something is a war crime or not, but that an individual is responsible for it. Okay? Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time Chairman, <laughs> that's your title. So, so I'm just going to be brief. But in 1937, there were a couple of, of treaties that are important for us here that were concluded. Um, and the first is the Geneva Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Terrorism. The second is the Convention for the Creation of an International Criminal Court. The problem for us uh, now uh, is that the Jurisdiction, ratio materiae, of that court was confined to terrorism. It was not a standing permanent uh, tribunal with uh, plenary jurisdiction, but it was the first time uh, that states had agreed on the establishment of an international criminal court. Um, following the Second World War, we know what happened. Um, uh, we had Two military tribunals established, Nuremberg and uh, the Tokyo Tribunal. Um, what, what were the crimes that, that these tribunals had jurisdiction over? Well, it turns out that you know, this charter that was annexed to the, the agreement providing for the establishment of the International Military Tribunal uh, <coughs> contained principles, jurisdiction, um, and, and it defined the crimes um, within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And these crimes corresponded to the legal charges outlined in Justice Jackson's report. Justice Jackson was the prosecutor. And so they took the prosecutor's allegations and borrowed from them in establishing what the crimes were that the tribunal would have jurisdiction over. Again, maybe a little bit backwards. Uh, crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. The, the same old list. Uh, judgment of the tribunal, and I mentioned this before, but I'll quote it now, uh, says that the charter is, quote, the expression of international law existing at the time of its creation. Okay. Thereafter, the uh, General Assembly was still a little bit uncomfortable, so it tasked the International Law Commission with not only uh, establishing the Nuremberg principles, but also a draft code of offenses against the peace and security of mankind, a full draft code. The commission did this first time in 1951. That was sent back to the commission. Second time in 1954, that one, ran into the increasingly icy atmosphere of the Cold War. And it sat there. The excuse the General Assembly finally gave was that the draft code raised problems related to the definition of aggression. And, and, and we can't define aggression. We don't know what that is. And so we have to put the draft code in the freezer and wait till we define aggression. Well, they did define aggression in 1974. They adopted, some say by accident, the resolution on the definition of aggression. Okay? So you think, you know, file out the draft code project. Nope, didn't do that. It, sat, it continued to sit there until the early 80s when the, commission, when the General Assembly again said, uh, maybe with some trepidation, uh, that the commission ought to work on uh, uh, reviving 
this draft code. So, um, 1981, the commission completed work on draft code in 1996. I left the commission in 91. I was there 10 years, as I mentioned, and that wasn't enough time uh, to complete work on the draft code. Uh, and partly, I think it was because the special rapporteur, uh, Ambassador Dudu Tian from Senegal, very capable person, was sensitive to the feelings of the General Assembly about this project. And it was, as far as I can tell, completely bound up with the Cold War. The Soviets didn't want it. Therefore, the Americans wanted it. The Soviets didn't want a tribunal. Therefore, the Americans wanted a tribunal <coughs> until it became a reality. And then, of course, all of a sudden, woo, we, we coiled in horror. Um, so, and I'm, I'll finish on this note, the ILC not only uh, prepared this draft code of uh, uh, crimes, the, the word offense offended a couple of members of the commission as being too, too light. They said, these are crimes, these aren't mere offenses. And so um, uh, the name was changed. Uh, but also the commission had adopted in 1994 um, a draft statute of an international criminal court. These two drafts form the basis of the Rome Statute of the ICC. So I think that pretty much brings us up to date. I, I still haven't explained, and I'm, I'll wait with interest for an explanation of how international law deals with individuals, uh, <laughs> reaches down and deals with individuals. But uh, I, I hope that gives us some historical background on this whole problem. Thanks very much, Steve. And I think it's uh, appropriate, in, in view of Steve's remarks, um, for me to lay out the uh, sort of rules for the roundtable after the roundtable has already begun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm <above> the rules. <laughs> um, which is to say that uh, uh, all of the uh, commentators are sort of uh, aware of the sort of general agenda that we're pursuing and are welcome to give sort of longer remarks of the kind that Steve did or, or rather more uh, brief ones. Um, but uh, because we are keen for it to be a conversation even though we have an agenda, if any of you wants to uh, respond as we're going to the remarks that anyone's made, just uh, put your um, uh, placard um, on its head so that I know to turn to you before turning to the next person in the queue. So, um, having said that, Steve uh, laid out uh, some sense of how these norms um, developed over the course of the 20th century in fits and starts. Um, and um, uh, Charles Jallo, uh, you have uh, reflected very thoughtfully about the ways in which uh, these norms continue to be developed, particularly in the context of the development of uh, African human rights institutions. But um, um, one of the things uh, that uh, has been an issue is the bifurcation uh, that we have seen uh, between traditional atrocity crimes and other transnational crimes, um, such as terrorism and human trafficking. Um, and uh, it would be valuable if you could reflect a little bit about uh, the implications of the merger between those two sets of crimes in the 2014 Malabo Protocol the future are giving us a sense of whether the normative framework is continuing to evolve. Thank you so much. And of course, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Linda is uh, probably I'm the only one in the room that might not be a job talking in front of Linda. <laughs> 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 Looking for yeah. an academic position at LSU where she was visiting. <laughs> and we hit it off, and it's, I wouldn't have known back then that I'll be part of something like this. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And of course, among uh, all these luminaries, uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I find the, the, the international criminal law conversation even more interesting now uh, because we've always sort of taken as a starting point this notion that there are these things we call international crimes. Sometimes you hear a, little, a bit of a qualifier, uh, core international crimes or international crimes strict to a sense this is the Basuni sort of attempt to catalog all these ways we understand international criminal law and international crimes as part of that understanding. 
And then, of course, we take as a second kitty, second basket, this notion of transnational crimes. These are mercenaries, you know, counterfeiting, drug trafficking, human trafficking, maybe terrorism, you know, crimes that cross borders. So this is not really our main interest, per se, right? This is for so international criminal lawyers, the new international criminal lawyers, one might say, considering that this other body of transnational international criminal law has been around for a lot longer, we kind of cabin the atrocity crimes. Now atrocity has become sort of the new uh, good way to describe the genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And it's interesting in that both the theoretical level and the practical level. The theoretical level, it seems as if we are happy to make the distinction, maybe supposing that the reality out there is different, even though if you look at the reality out there, states seem to see the two not necessarily that differently from the point of view of the regulator. Um, so George Schwarzenberger could write back in the 50s, there's not such a thing as international criminal law, uh, but today that would not be true, right? We would say, oh, of course there is international criminal law, in part because no longer do we just have all over the details of the code, but we have an international criminal code with these core crimes embedded in it. And so where does the Malabo protocol come in there? So we have the theoretical level of separation, but in practice, perhaps not so much of a separation. Well, we see a perfect example where states are saying, at least in one region of the world, you know what, we have problems of order here. It could be terrorism, it could be mercenarism, human trafficking, toxic dumping of hazardous waste. We want to regulate those. But yeah, while we are at it, of course we're interested in genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So essentially a merger uh, at the practical level of what we had at the theoretical level thought of as a distinct, a distinct categories of crime. So it raises a question, in, you know, in other words, for me, whether that distinction was ever a good one to have in the first place. Uh, because then when you talk to delegations and governments that are part of these negotiations, they seem to think that they're dealing with something common in the sense that we still have to figure out how to deal with this at a domestic level. We still have to figure out ways of uh, cooperating with other states when you think about extradition and mutual legal assistance. So uh, in, in the ASP in, in December 2013, the South African Deputy Minister of Justice said to me, well, look, Charles, we, 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 this wrong statute crimes are very interesting for us. But we have a big problem about drugs. And we have a problem with Nigeria, and we don't want to fight with Nigeria. We'd rather have the regional court deal with this. So in a sense, suggesting that there is something, some merit, at least at the practical level, of dealing with this criminality. And he talked about one case where they arrested a number of Nigerian drug traffickers, and tried it, and there was a question of whether they would be sent they tried in South Africa or sent back to Nigeria. And it became a political issue between the two countries. They didn't want to get into that. So in a sense, maybe there are implications that go beyond the way we would think about this from the international criminal law point of view as an international crime stricto sensu, this problem of the state prosecutions, to elements of state cooperation that we have weaker in our own regime. Because of course, if you think about the long line of treaties in up to 20 categories of crimes that pursue in catalogs, it seems as if we've had a lot of history we're figuring out how to do mutual legal assistance between states, investigations all the way to here, I want somebody, send them to me, you know, exercise that person. So maybe that distinction, in a sense, would collapse. So I'm beginning to be uh, very curious to see where, well, I'm not sure that I have answers, but just in terms of my, my concluding point, that maybe uh, the takeaway for me is international criminal law and the attempt that we try to make to distinguish international crimes on the one hand from so-called transnational crimes on the other, may not be as solid a distinction because there is, at least at the political level, at the level of states that want to regulate, at least in one region we're seeing an example of this, an attempt to merge the two. And I wonder whether there might not be bigger implications for international criminal lawyers uh, to accept that we could cross that bridge because maybe we'll see the benefits of the cooperation we lack now from the transnational side because we've had hundreds of years of experience, a lot of treaties, regulating how you extradite people and deal with counterfeiters and you know sort of the more economic crimes kind of basket. And so I'm not sure that my answer is, 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 is concluded, you know, complete yet in the sense of whether I prefer one or the other, but I do feel that it might be valuable for us to engage that conversation and the Malabo Protocol is an opportunity to do that. Thanks very much, Charles. Well, uh, both you and Steve have reflected a little bit about how the uh, normative framework uh, has been evolving and also have touched on how the evolution of the framework has been implicated by and helped to shape the evolving institutions. Um, 
in this area. And um, but would you like to speak to this for a moment? No, I just wanted to ask Charles a question because I was struck that in the last month or so, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has, has issued, um, they're called principles and guidelines on human, uh, on protecting human and people's rights while countering terrorism in Africa. And I wondered if somehow the African Commission was sort of ahead of the game and actually kind of putting out some, some norms for that. Uh, definitely. I think that, I mean, so the, I didn't get too much into the Malabo Protocol, but I have the Malabo Protocol right here. And when you look at it, basically it's about 14 offenses that are codified in the regional treaty, at least they're proposing uh, as a regional treaty. The eight countries have signed it. We need 15 ratifications. No one has ratified yet. So it might take five to ten years for that to happen if you look at the history of AU uh, treaty making practice. So when you look at the crime, so if you go to the war crimes, genocide crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression, you could see the international influence. They basically took the Rome Statute as a starting point, but they didn't end there. They actually tweaked some of the Rome Statute definitions in some interesting examples uh, that could well be progressive tweakings, like genocide, they took the Akayesu, rape can be forms of genocide, to, in, to actually add a new paragraph to what would be the traditional 1948 definition. I think that's fairly progressive. Um, and of course, it's gender neutral, so it could be you know violence, uh, rape, and sexual violence by men against men, and so on, which we've seen in the Congo and other contemporary countries. So there's that one part. But if, if you look at the rest of the ten crimes, and so this goes back to you, Lee. The source of these uh, regional conventions, so like AU has uh, the OAU adopted a mercenarism convention. They have a, a convention they adopted on democracy and good governance. Uh, the the so-called crime of unconstitutional change of government, basically dealing with the scourge of coup d'etats that have essentially destroyed the promise of independence for the continent. And you go down the list, uh, toxic dumping of hazardous waste. The Basel Convention came out of Ivory Coast experience with the dumping of hazardous waste out, while well, Africa had regulated that. So essentially, in the regional, if you will, state practice, the acquit that we've seen from African states, we've seen these norms. Some of them forming in the form of the treaties, but also in the form of the work of the Commission. And that's feeding into the regional lawmaking that we see now. So I think I'm not too surprised that the Commission has been on the front end of some of these things. And by the way, they were some of the first uh, big sort of investors of the Rome system. They supported the Rome Statute. They actually got African states on board through the famous declaration in the region. So in we got to take common position, this thing is a good thing for us. Of course, now you rewind, it's a whole other conversation. So I hope that answers <laughs> Uh, and, and I think that's a good segue to talking a little bit about uh, some of the institutions we uh, have on the table here. Um, and uh, Beth Van Schaak, um, you have, uh, Beth has just finished a sort of magisterial uh, examination of hybrid justice. And at the outset, you uh, uh, offer a, a sort of a history of uh, international criminal justice institutions. And, as you know, and um, this is also something, Chris, that you reflected on during your talk, um, the uh, early history, or one might say most of that history, was um, characterized by institutions that were aptly labeled victor's justice. Um, the question that we're confronted with now, especially uh, as we uh, grapple with legitimacy of the institutions um, uh, uh, at the international level today, is to what extent do they continue to reflect victor's justice, particularly those established by the Security Council. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so first, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I sort of feel like we first met when you were making your transition or your expansion from a domestic criminal law kind of frame of right. reference. To, and so I always feel like I've been on this journey a little bit with you, and it's just <laughs> blossomed you. ever since, and I know it will continue to flower in your new role, so I'm really excited to keep working with you. It's lovely to be here. Um, exactly. Sort of as Christopher mentioned, it's you know it cannot be denied that the origins of this field are very much premised in an idea of victor's justice, and particular counts and incidents were ignored or eschewed or changed precisely because they would have triggered the two quote quote defense that you also defense, and so they literally became invisible to the proceedings before Nuremberg and Tokyo. I don't think that's the right term anymore. I think it's more about power that. International criminal law has now become a tool of the powerful that is imposed on the less powerful. And we're moving towards, and there's always this sort of goal of the universality on the hill, and we're making you know, small movements toward that. And I will talk about some glimmers where I think it doesn't work out necessarily that power is the defining 
um, characteristics. But certainly, um, certainly, I think it's fair to say that's still um, foundational to the field. Um, I was at the ICTY very early as a junior prosecutor for the students there was my first shot out of law school. And we actually organized our office around the three, de the three groups um, of defendants. So there was a team that was working on Serbian defendants, a team that was working on Croatian defendants, a team that was working on Bosnian defendants. And the goal was to avoid this label of victor's justice. But in a way, it became this artificial sort of equality because in many respects, the violence was asymmetrical and it was associated more with Serbian militia and entities and leadership. And so we made a point of trying to indict individuals from the different groups, but on balance, we ended up in a much more asymmetrical world. Was that victor's justice? Not necessarily. Certainly the Serbians won certain victories on particular battles, and the way in which Bosnia was redrawn very much reflected the ethnic cleansing that they were able to accomplish, but not entirely. So that, I think, those indictments tried to follow the crimes rather than necessarily being a an issue of Victor's justice. This special court for Sierra Leone achieved perfect symmetry. Three defendants from the three different groups, um, and that was partly because some individuals um, passed away during the time, but there was again this idea of sort of, you know, a pox on everyone's house. Um, I think as we see the ICC, um, you know, it's not about Victor's justice, it's a combination of who has ratified the treaty and a, a very early embrace of the treaty by the states in Africa, all of Latin America now has joined, all of Europe. None of the powerful states have joined, either in terms of the permanent three on the Security Council or the up and coming, the, the Indias and the, the Pakistans of the world. Um, the, the jurisdiction is moving towards universality. Will it ever achieve universality? It's not clear. But the way in which the jurisdictional framework works means that you have glimmers of, of opportunity where power will not necessarily be the defining characteristic. So because the tribunal has jurisdiction on a territorial basis and on a nationality basis, the ICC and the Office of the Prosecutor can be examining crimes committed by UK service members who were active in um, both Iraq and potentially Afghanistan. They're focusing on Iraq at the moment. Because Afghanistan joined the ICC, they can look at crimes committed by US service members on the territory of Afghanistan. And so that's a way around the sort of power um, uh, framework. Will those cases go forward? You know, it remains to be seen. We're also seeing, I mean, the, this, if we include universal jurisdiction within the system, which I think we're going to get to that later if we want to talk about it as a system, I think we should. <coughs> to be sure, in the early days, it, it felt very much like colonial powers, the metropole, sort of prosecuting crimes committed within their former colonial holdings. And that was a, an uncomfortable dynamic, but we're seeing increasingly some peer-to-peer -peer uses of, um, of universal jurisdiction in South Africa, for example, with respect to Zimbabwe and potential Zimbabwean defense, Argentina opening cases involving Franco-era crimes in Spain. Will they move forward? Maybe not. There's obviously massive um, statute of limitations issues to, to um, surmount. Um, President Bush cannot travel to Europe, and nor can any of his inner circle. Why? Because they're subject to potential arrest there. So there's a form of accountability, there's a form of egalitarianism there. It doesn't play out at the same level. Um, but again, it's not perfect, so Syria would be a classic situation that should be in front of the International Criminal Court. We, we have a, a state that is absolutely unwilling and probably now at this point unable to examine crimes that were being committed there, and yet Syria has a protector in the um, Security Council, so that case cannot go forward. Likewise, with respect to North Korea. But you know, if you look at China's recent responses to North Korea's, um, you know, dabbling in its weapons testing, we see that China's, you know, getting a little fed up. And you know, might China reach a point where it'd be willing to abstain on another proposal to move that case forward before the ICC? You know, we'll see. Um, and you know, your your point about my hybrid papers is a good one. I mean, that's a very interesting case in which it's very hard to do a hybrid court without the consent of the state. Now, can that consent be coerced? Absolutely. But often what you're seeing is states saying, we can't manage this on our own. We need international assistance. So the Central African Republic, which joined the ICC, which self-referred um, early crimes there, and then again, the most recent crimes connected with the Seleka Alliance, it's just like redundant, but whatever. Seleka means alliance, but the Seleka Rebellion. Um, 
you know, and then now it's created the special chambers in the Central African Republic. So where we thought it was going to be a two-tier system with the ICC sort of handling the big, um, all the big atrocity situations, and then with some domestic activity, now we're seeing three-tier, maybe even four-tier with the introduction of a regional criminal court in Africa, potentially. So um, it's not so much a victor's justice. I think it's still a tool of the powerful. But again, there are these kind of ways in which um, power is not able to either block movement forward towards accountability, or power gets shunted in a, in a good direction, potentially in support of um, justice and accountability. Thanks. Uh, uh, and Beth, you sort of lay out a picture of a, a dynamic process of mm -hmm. institutional um, evolution, one where each uh, uh, experiment sort of affects um, sometimes in the lurch, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, 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 less so, what comes next. And so turning to Fausto Picard, um, Fausto, you uh, have been uh, uh, involved in uh, institutions of international criminal justice at the global level from um, uh, very early on as far as the inception of the latest generation. Um, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about how these processes of institutional evolution have affected each other. To what extent is the shape uh, of the International Criminal Court a response to uh, what happened um, uh, in the context of ICTY and ICTR? Um, what lessons were learned, um, and in your, your view, which lessons were not learned? Well, that's, a, that's a very different question to answer, of course. Um, but uh, the first, let me say how um, happy I am to uh, be invited to uh, come here to the seminar uh, in honor of Linda. We did quite a lot of work together in the past years. And, uh, I'm quite uh, uh, an admirer of how she has moved from criminal law to international law, with being uh, extremely efficient also in international law and not only in criminal law. Well, I can assess later uh, uh, less what she did in criminal law than in international law. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm sure it was the same, the same uh, level. Uh, let me try to build a bit on what colleagues have said. Because uh, what is now the ICC is a problematic uh, issue in light of the history. Because uh, the history went for a certain time from Nuremberg on, and uh, Steve has uh, made all the passes from, from that time to the 90s when, when the four uh, courts were established by the Security Council, we have a sort of uh, um, continuous, uh, if you want a continuous uh, uh, progress or not progress or delayed progress of the international law, but more or less on the same on the same problem. The issue, the essential issue that had to be resolved was the individual responsibility. Still has uh, clarified that very well, and we don't insist on that. Maybe the um, the Nuremberg experience was helped in that by the fact that the Tribunal of Nuremberg, although it's called the International Military Tribunal, is not international. It was not international, in fact. It was a domestic court, a transnational court, I would say, today, in the sense that the occupying power always exercised jurisdiction. And they are only get bound to the size of the digital and the territory they occupy in Germany and Japan were occupied countries. So uh, each of the countries uh, occupying could exercise jurisdiction. And then through their military commissions, essentially, most of the work was done by military commissions. But they decided to exercise on certain crimes jurisdiction together. Is that fully international? I have some notes. I have some doubts, although there is a treaty. I mean, the London Charter is a treaty. Uh, and this could have, have helped in assessing individual criminal responsibility, because uh, it's obvious an occupying tribunal exercise jurisdiction. The problem was the law. It was custom internet, was the law. 
And the only way to exercise it was custom international law. It's not a legion in the charter, but it's what they did at the end, and it's what was reflected in the principles of that correctly the, um, the International Law Commission uh, picked up and, uh, and put on paper. And put on paper, but if I remember one demand that the ANC was to state the principle, not to comment upon that. Right. So there was no margin of uh, <laughs> changing the law, or, or just to reflect what the uh, document is done. But this is just uh, to make uh, uh, to make a point, and this is seen, if you look at it, it's the same as what happened with the Security Council. But here is a step forward, because here is truly international. The initiative is international, and it's not on the over-occupied uh, countries. It's just the UN exercise in the jurisdiction. This is a big step forward as compared with, uh, with Nuremberg, but not because of the victor justice. And, uh, at the end, uh, I have of the feeling that the problem with victim justice uh, concur, is the same now, in a way, because it's true there is there are attempts of getting out of the victim justice, but in fact, uh, um, the attempt was made. But if one looks now at the outcome, it looks more as a victim justice than, than uh, as an equal justice to everybody. In one is clear. It was as of the beginning a bit of justice, and, and it has not changed at all. And notwithstanding justice that was made to a certain extent by the government, but that too is victor justice because it's clearly against the other group. And, um, and the ICTY is less evident, but looking at the cases and how the cases came to conclusion, Exposed, it looks more a victim of justice than, than an equal justice, in my view. Um, so there are uh, limited. On that, uh, the, there was a, a step that was made uh, in law. The law that was applied in Nuremberg is not the law that was applied later. And that's partly because of the work of the ILC in shaping the law, trying to change the law, although it came later, it came in 96, after the two tribunals were, were adopted, were established, um, and partly for uh, other reasons, but uh, the problem is that, uh, again, the problem that Steve has mentioned, going from uh, international conflicts to domestic conflicts, that had become, in the, in the meantime, main feature of the complex today, or one of the main features of them. And again, there was the problem what we do when it's domestic. So there is always a tension that people mentioned at the beginning between international and domestic in, uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. And here, the step forward was made by the case law. States were not able to make that. Uh, they were able to exercise justice internationally, make that step forward, but not to decide on the law. And uh, the law was continued to be shaped exactly for international conflicts. It was uh, the ICTY at the very beginning which made this the breakthrough, saying, uh, well, what is illegal in uh, an international conflict is illegal also in a domestic conflict. How we did, I don't go into the details, but uh, this decision changed completely the law. Because now the law is more or less the same, applicable in the two contexts. So it is, and that was done, why? Because uh, the law applicable was customary international law, and in assessing customary international law, a court has a margin of appreciation, inevitably. Uh, one can say, we accept only what is no doubt custom international law, but in fact, there is the possibility of changing something, of moving <laughs> something, of uh, making a step forward. And now the ICC. The ICC is in a way a step backwards, as to be law. It's an international court, 
but that too is a step backwards because it's a treaty. And the treaty either becomes universal or the jurisdiction is not universal. That's quite clear, internationally. And uh, the chances of having a treaty universal, as we see, are limited. I don't know when there could be a universal acceptance of a treaty. So in a way, the international community made a step backwards going from a, uh, from a jurisdiction really exercised universally by the international community to a jurisdiction inside the part of the international community. This may affect the law as well. We will have a step backwards on the law, possibly yes, if the court sticks to the statute. Because the statute has been uh, goes into detail, does not allow the marginal assessment of custom international law, or may allow it, but the court is hesitant to go in that direction. Obviously, because the, the statute says that primarily the law applicable is the statute, and the documents uh, annexed the elements of crime specifically. Um, could go beyond on custom international law, but he's hesitant to do it. And for the time being, has not done it. So, margin of uh, manoeuvre in interpreting a statute are not the same as in custom international law. So, will the development go in the right direction, or are we going to a system that may become efficient but partial, may even fragment the law? It's paradoxical to say that uh, creating a court that's permanent uh, and, uh, and the universe, and natural universal may lead to fragmented law that before was not fragmented, notwithstanding the variety of jurisdictions, because more or less they went together. And uh, we have cases in which errors made by court A have been corrected by court B. In, the, in assessing custom international law, and then accepted again by court A. So this is something very, very important, the, the cross fertilization of the different courts, the dialogue of the different courts has made the law progress, essentially, but remain universal. Will be, will be the case with the ICC is still problematic, maybe it's too early to say it, but certainly we are at the sort of uh, Crossroad of international change. There is a big change I mean, in the in the situation now. So, yeah. Thank you. You have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in. I thought your observations about Nuremberg and Tokyo were really interesting. And um, one of the things I tried to explore a little bit in this paper was could a could a group of states reproduce Nuremberg now? Could five or six states get together and say, let's create an international tribunal, we'll do a treaty amongst ourselves, and we'll subject some <laughs> incident, some crime, whatever, to jurisdiction, it's been explored, it's been explored in Syria. Um, and the proposal was first that a regional group of states could create a tribunal, maybe under some form of protective or effects jurisdiction because of the refugee flows across borders. Um, it hasn't been explored, I, I, you know, I haven't seen it, but potentially you could add European states into that now given the, you know, that the refugee flows have now moved northward. Um, it's being explored with respect to MH17, the downing of the plane in Ukraine where you have um, a pooling of domestic jurisdictional competencies, the territorial state would join, um, a passive personality state, the, many of the victims were Dutch, the Dutch could join, Malaysia could join because it was its flagship. Um, and so then the question arises, would Syria and or Russia need to consent to that because it would be their nationals that would potentially be brought for the tribunal? Of course, we don't know with respect to MH17, it's quite clear with respect to Syria. And there were many states that were quite intrigued by this idea, but it ultimately never moved forward. And I think part of the reason was that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And of course, there would be a fear that the Gulf states could come together and create an international tribunal for, for example, Israel. Um, and then you've, you know, if you've done it for MH17, why could you not also do it for other situations around the globe? So you're absolutely right. I think it was not a pure international tribunal just because it was a creation of a treaty. No. But it depends. I think it may happen in the future if you have a situation of occupation. Exactly. If not, I see it very mm -hmm. more problematic. Mm -hmm. But look at the experience of Africa. The idea of an African court, or to give in jurisdiction, which is in the protocol, 
already given jurisdiction to the African Court of Human Rights on criminal matters is essentially following the same principle. I don't know if they want that, but if they do, it should be that. It should not be an international court, it should be a transnational court. It's always under the uh, umbrella of the complementarity principle. Because if you are states that do it, it's domestic. So we'll be covered by the complementarity principle, and the ICC could always intervene. And that would be very favorable to that. A solution of this kind, having states dealing with jurisdiction themselves uh, to, to help improving the complementary principle would be very helpful. Also for the ICC, because the ICC cannot take all the cases. So each states get together and, and do the, the work themselves. It would be a good, a good solution, in my opinion. Police Weiger, um, perhaps we can uh, pull you into the conversation at this juncture. Uh, we've, we've been um, grappling with some of the particular challenges facing international tribunals as international tribunals. And we'll have a chance uh, to explore some of the alternatives in very depth uh, shortly. And so hopefully we can. Uh, cabin, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Charles, I didn't see you. So we'll come right, we'll come right back to that question afterward. Um, but, uh, but before we turn to some of those alternatives in, in greater depth, um, Lee, perhaps you could uh, reflect um, a little bit on some of the particular kinds of challenges that are facing international tribunals. Um, and in particular, uh, one thing that you've already had occasion to explore is um, some of the challenges deriving from the cultural and linguistic diversity of uh, people before the court and of court personnel. Okay. Um, thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Linda has, it's been a real honor um, and a pleasure to work with her in many different activities over the years, and she's been an inspiration to me. But one of the things I want to do is we have worked very closely on the Brandeis Institute for International Judges, of which Linda was the co-director for many, many sessions. And we've also worked together on uh, an ad hoc tribunal for the history project that's ongoing. So I want to bring in um, some thoughts from those two projects as I go. So let me start. Um, also appropriately for Linda's transformation in her career, I'm going to start with a little story about domestic criminal justice and how um, uh, language and culture can come into there. And this is, um, there's a, a Stanford linguist, John Whitford, who we've been um, analyzing over the last couple of years, the George Zimmerman trial. Um, of course, George Zimmerman was accused with killing um, Trayvon Martin. And the main prosecutor's uh, witness was a young woman, Rachel Jontel, who was a speaker of what Link was called African American Vernacular English. And um, she was on the stand for many hours, and uh, the jury and the court um, transcribed her <coughs> part not understanding her English. And she was also widely uh, seen as a very ignorant and uneducated person. And as it turns out, um, in the deliberations of the jury, they didn't take into account any of her um, any of her testimony at all, even though she was the person on the phone with Trayvon Martin as he was being pursued by George Zimmerman. So the Stanford linguist John Rickford, um, who's been working on this, said that uh, widespread ignorance and hostility about authentic linguistic and cultural difference in America led to a verdict that may well have been different had the key witness been better understood and viewed as more credible by the jury. So I bring that up because we're talking about a domestic court um, trial and the kind of misunderstanding that led in some people's view to a uh, miscarriage of justice. So the questions, this leads to two questions. Um, first, in the context of a courtroom, how might linguistic and cultural mismatches between a person testifying and those whose role is to evaluate that testimony impact the fairness for trial and its outcome? And secondly, even if the challenges associated with this, these kinds of mismatches are recognized um, how can a court as an institution try to avoid these misunderstandings so that there's not this outcome? So then let's take this, I, you know, this situation and then take it into the international realm um, where you have um, large mismatches between the people testifying, the witnesses, the, the affected regions, and the people 
um, who are working for the court or the judges who are the fact finding and are evaluating testimony. So you can see that there, there is a real, can be a real issue here. And it also brings up a third question, which is what happens at the institutional level when you have the people working for the court who also come from very, very different backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, uh, cultural, linguistic, and training, and so on. So I just wanted to, to give a couple of um, you know a couple of examples of how this has played out in international criminal courts and tribunals to date from some research I've been doing, and which has received some really important um, input from Charles Jello. Um, let's look at the ad hoc tribunals, the, the Yugoslav and Rwandan tribunals, and the special court for Sierra Leone. Um, the judges or the fact finders in these cases in, operate almost entirely through interpretation of, of testimony and translation of documents. And there's been uh, there's a very interesting book that was published in the last six months um, by a former translator and advisor at the ICTY, um, Ellen Elias Bursat. It's called Translating Evidence and Interpreting Testimony in a War Crimes mm -hmm. Tribunal. And she really like pulls the veil away from everything that has happened, both in translation of documents and interpretation of the courtroom. And many, many of the judgments at the ICTY, she has done a full analysis, mention language problems. There is in the judgment. It may have to do with um, terms that are misunderstood. Um, in one case, different three different dialects of Albanian use a single term that, that referenced three different colors. And since the colors happen to be um, green or yellow um, or blue, happen to mean uh, they have, there were different colors of uniforms um, worn by either the military or the police. And there were different ones. It was unclear what they were talking about. So, um, uh, so I'm sure you know this. There were color cards they held up and said, green this, which was yellow, or green this, which was blue, or green this, which looked like uh, green. So these are, these are huge issues. Um, there's other, there's, there's so many issues. The, the judgments, most of the, well, none of the judgments at the ICTR, um, to my knowledge, were ever translated into Kenya Rwanda, even though Kenya Rwanda is a working language of the Rwandan national judiciary. So that some of these judgments cannot be incorporated um, into, the, you know, into the citations of the jurisprudence of the national um, courts. One translator that I interviewed uh, from the ICTR said, language is the poor cousin that no one wants to have at home. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much translation that had to be happening between the defense and the prosecution that doing these judgments, I mean, we don't have time for that. That was sort of what it was like. But what does this mean for the long-term impact? Um, there were enormous cultural um, issues that came up um, at the ICTR and also the special court for Sierra Leone. Um, in, so just with the, the, the unfamiliarity of, of people with certain kinds of procedures. Um, one ICTR judge said to me once, um, you know, if you have someone from France, someone from the United States, someone from Europe, whatever, they've seen what happens in the courtroom. They've seen a movie, they've seen Perry Mason, whatever. They know when you get in there, you're asked a question, you answer. You couldn't, you didn't have that assumption of a certain familiarity with this pre procedure for lots of the witnesses who were coming at the ICTR. So it, it was a real method they had to pull them through this procedure. Same thing at the Special Court for Sierra Leone where um, they had translation from a, um, a Creole language, Creole and Sierra Leone, into English and, um, and a lot of other languages, but there was a low level of education with a lot of the witnesses. So that also brought up problems. Um, there was non-specificity about time and distance, you know, how people understood that. What did it mean when something was not very far? You know, was there a way for them to say how many miles it was, for example? Um, Sierra, special court for Sierra Leone never issues about um, what does it mean to be a child? At what age does childhood end? Um, can, that, can that person not become a, a, a soldier? Um, what does it mean when people feel that there was some um, supernatural agency going on in, in some of um, the, the things that happened? What does a fact finder do when someone says, you know, there was a supernatural force that, that took, that was responsible for this action? So there, were, there was lots and lots of mismatches. Lots of um, what at one um, Brandeis Institute for International Judges we call dissonances. And it wasn't just in the courtroom. In a recent article by Richard Goldstone, first chief prosecutor, uh, at the Yugoslav Tribunal, he said that the policies that they set for witness proofing at the ICTY were really based on the idea that there was that people who are linguistically and culturally unfamiliar 
with this procedure, saying they really had to have witness proofing, even though this is not something that was seen as um, uh, even ethical in some of the courts in the UK and Scotland and England. So they, it was based on this that they had to sort of come up with a certain kind of procedure. Okay, so what this was the ad hocs and the special court personnel. What about the ICC? Well, if complementarity really worked, we wouldn't have to worry about this. All these would be domestic um, prosecutions, and people would have the cultural and the linguistic knowledge. But of course, that's not what is happening. So um, ICC has enormous problems. It cannot plan for the languages that will be, be relevant in its cases. It, can't, it doesn't have two years um, for warning that they're going to have to deal with a particular language and then say, how are we going to get someone to, to be an interpreter? Um, sometimes they are, they are training interpreters through the intermediary of, a, of another language. That's what they've done for Zagawa, a language in a Darfuri language that only has 250,000 speakers. No trained interpreter, obviously. They're trying to they train interpreters through the medium of Arabic, which is not ideal. Um, also, there's not enough ears on the testimony. Uh, it's, it's very clear. Um, from the ad hoc tribunal and from the special court personnel that, that the defense, remember the defense team who spoke the languages were constantly correcting some of the interpretation and correcting the official record in the courtroom. What happens if you only have an interpreter, someone testifying, and no one else is there to say, was that a correct, was that right? Did we get that? What's the problem here? It's a, it's a big problem. So let me just quickly say what happens within the courts when you actually have the, all the staff, the judges, the prosecutors, the defense, the people in the registry, they're all from different backgrounds. Chris already talked about some of the issues of misunderstanding between an inquisitorial and adversarial terminology. Um, and certainly Fausto and, and um, Linda have, have worked on some of these issues between civil and common law. So that's, those are ones that, in a way, are kind of predictable. Um, but um, there's other things that come up. What about different cultures of work? that people bring to a court? What about different work ethics? What about how much somebody's willing to put into a group effort? What about how much somebody wants to depend on a legal assistant? Um, and other judges think, well, no, this is something we have to do our, ourselves. Um, in the process of interviewing some people for this oral history project, there have been um, some Americans who worked at the ad hocs who were um, annoyed, if not to say outraged, that anyone should expect them to speak French, or that they would be put on a, on a panel that had French speakers. <laughs> well, why can't they just speak English? I mean, there was this sort of an, an attitude that I don't even have time to deal with this. And yet, people come from all these different backgrounds. So um, it is kind of a, it's interesting to see, um, to see some of the, the tensions that come up. And let me just add, one other issue that I think is interesting, internal to international courts and tribunals, and this is um, the dominance of English. And um, English is, uh, jurisprudence is cited more, more people speak English. If a, if a court has two languages, more people speak, speak English than French. Um, one legal scholar has said that there's sort of an English conveyor belt that's going in, you know, into international criminal law. And what does this do to the narrowing of legal thinking? And let me just quote um, a German scholar, Michael Bolander, who's been looking at this at the ICC. And he says, <coughs> English has become the lingua franca in international legal, academic, and practical dialogue. And there was a related concern that English intellectual and legal culture has drawn a thick veneer over the canvas of international criminal law as well. The differences in linguistic and cultural influence need attention as they are a primary determinant of the dialogue that constitutes international justice, not only in form, but also in substance. So I think this is something to think about. This is important because um, international criminal, especially the International Criminal Court, is supposed to be this universal court. And if it is not in some way addressing, and I think it's trying to, but you can't successfully address this kind of linguistic diversity and cultural diversity, it loses legitimacy. And that's a big problem for it. Thank you. Thanks very much. If I could just follow up with a question, mm -hmm. uh, Lee. You know, in uh, the related context of uh, intercultural negotiation, uh, there's much been written about the dissonance that one encountered, uh, but also about overcompensation um, and uh, the ways in which people who enter uh, intercultural negotiations will tend 
recognizing that they're intercultural to operate differently than they would in an intracultural scenario. Um, so that you end up sometimes with greater problems in the intracultural context. And you kind of signal this in your um, opening point about the Zimmerman trial than with the intercultural. And so I guess my question is, how self-conscious uh, to your mind is the effort occurring within international tribunals to compensate for these kinds of questions? And have you, did you encounter any instances of overcompensation? Can I ask, uh, is it okay for me? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. lucky to jump in with everybody. I actually first want to say that Charles did get the job off. <laughs> 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 it's an excellent job. <laughs> um, but, um, because I've been working on this project, we, you know, one of the things that struck me, Lee, and it, 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 it's actually the opposite, in a way, of Omar's question is, I've been struck over and over again by the judges, staff, lawyers, that they fail to recognize the issue. Well, they they the don't answer. really see it. I mean, Faust is obviously a huge mm -hmm. exception because he's become a common law lawyer. It's not only the legal differences, such as what you know Chris described, that they don't recognize, but they don't recognize the cultural priority differences, value differences. So I see the lack of compensation. But so maybe you could address both under and over compensation. Yeah. Um, and so I'm I'm working more on the ICC now, which is interesting. You know, obviously you can play the cultural card, and you can do that for um, um, for particular strategic reasons. And so maybe in some of the mediation stuff, that's what's coming in is that you can you know, come in and you can you can use that to your advantage. But I was struck, I, um, Fausto was one of the people interviewed for our ad hoc um, oral history project, and I was reviewing your transcript, and you were talking about how, I think in your first appeal judgment, there was a French speaker, an English speaker, a Spanish speaker, and you, and he was the informal translator um, <laughs> during the deliberations, and, and, at which point they said, why don't you just write the judgment, and it was his first judgment. But you said in your interview that there was a potential to leave, to leave thinking in a certain way by, by being the interpreter. And, and so that's, you know, it, it's, it's just something that people need to be aware of. And thank you, Linda, for that, because I, my contention is that with this sort of English common law sort of tradition kind of coming in and you know, bulldozing and way, flattening everything else, it's the people who, who don't speak other languages or who never have operated in a different system who don't see that there's a problem. They, they simply don't recognize that there's a potential for different, a different way of looking at things. And I think that's how they problem that. There uh, is the great line from the novel, A Widow for One Year, in which the uh, narrator um, is walking in um, the streets of the red light district and, in Amsterdam and sees all of these uh, uh, Indonesian and Nigerian uh, prostitutes interacting with um, clients from um, Japan and the Arab world and uh, realizes that uh, with a start that the language of the future is not English, <laughs> it's bad English. Having <laughs> <laughs> uh, said that, if I, if I could turn to our common lawyer, um, uh, and I know that that's been said disparagingly. We were just joking yesterday that one of his uh, one of his colleagues on the bench, uh, with consternation, said, "You're becoming a cop lawyer." <laughs> 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 but Foster, could you reflect a little bit about um, the normative dissonance that you you've encountered? Um, uh, on the bench um, at the uh, International Criminal Tribunals. Lee has sort of spoken about socio-cultural and uh, linguistic uh, dissonance, but um, one of the things that you and Linda have been speaking to is a clash of normative approaches. Well, that, that came uh, or essentially, it's difficult to, to identify all the issues of that. Um, there is the procedural issue, which I think 
later. And, uh, but um, it's clear that uh, the differences of backgrounds of uh, uh, the judges and uh, the collaborators of the judges well, uh, creates a problem of uh, uh, merging uh, the, the different approaches. But also, it should be a merger where you just don't impose one on the others as you can do sometimes, but you try to find really something which is common it, uh, and viable at the international level, which is not easy at all. It's not easy at all. The problem with translations is, uh, uh, I think it was a, a mistake at the beginning that was made. When you establish a court, and uh, either you decide what is the language, and that's finished, but if you take two languages, it's clear that any judge to be elected should have known the two languages. As simple as that. Any legal officer uh, recruited should have been recruited uh, between those who know the two languages. It's not so impossible because you have 500 people and you can find uh, 500 who know English and French. At least uh, at, a level, at a sufficient level to, uh, to understand uh, not just uh, how the translation goes, but uh, what is behind. It's a, it's a conceptual matter. I mean, the legal systems are different. Uh, that the language reflects the legal system. Many of the words cannot be, or the concept cannot be translated sometimes. You can't translate accountability in French. Accountability is a word that is used worldwide, but nobody knows what it means. <laughs> and certainly, with the English speakers more or less know what it is. Not necessarily everybody, but no, no, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, those who do not speak English have no idea. I heard a, an outstanding lawyer, French lawyer, in a debate for the president of the ICJ, so somebody who had some experience, say, but after the debate on the company, they said, but after all, what are we speaking of? <laughs> because this can be translated into French, therefore it's a non-concept. <laughs> <laughs> because the French can express all the legal concepts. That was his, his approach. You see, if you start discussing with that, you don't arrive at any, uh, at any place. You want to apply your, uh, your internal system. And sometimes you see that in the case law, that uh, some decisions reflect or some dissents reflect uh, a, an internal position and not, do not try to merge uh, anything. I mean, uh, uh, there are cases in which, for instance, a judge coming from Germany wanted to apply the German law, the, the approach of the German law, which is not the international one. In that but it's, uh, um, so there, are, there have been several problems in this regard. As to the example that you mentioned, uh, in fact, I did what I wanted. <laughs> but I did what I wanted uh, seriously and impartially because I took uh, the approach of the covenant of civil and political rights and expressed in the decision. But in doing so, I'm sure that I did not get what some of the participants wanted because one of the views is that this is a treaty of states and not bind it on an international court. And they made it as if it were binding on an international court. I think my position was the correct one. But of course, it is my position. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could bring Mark Ellis into the conversation. Um, uh, Mark Lee uh, at one point said, uh, you know, if only complementarity really worked, we wouldn't be grappling. <laughs> with some of the kinds of problems that now uh, several people have highlighted in this context. And uh, one of the things that you have also been sort of uh, giving careful consideration to in your uh, scholarship is um, how to make complementary work, um, and in particular, the role of um, domestic prosecutions or national prosecutions. But um, while uh, I understand your position to be that that's going to remain and perhaps even become more important.
point um, as we go forward in this realm, that it's by no means um, a context or an approach free from difficulties of its own. And um, uh, it would be, I think, really um, helpful to hear your reflections on some of the kinds of problems that you um, encountered heading the investigation of the um, Sanusi uh, prosecution in Libya. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Omar. And I, I just, Linda, it, it's been talked about how you transition from the domestic to the international, which is absolutely true. But I, I want to emphasize that your transition has been at the very highest level. Uh, internationally, you were considered to be part of that unique group upper echelon of those that are involved in this area. That's an extraordinary achievement on that. But probably the most extraordinary achievement, I think, is, is sitting back and watching these students and listening to these students talk about you as a professor. I think that's your, that's your legacy uh, on that, and they, uh, they absolutely adore you. Congratulations. I handpicked them. <laughs> <laughs> Move on, but I, I want to, Stephen had started this conversation with this sense of public to international, and, and then uh, Beth had brought in also this, this point of the uh, accountability in Serbia. And so, one of the questions well, how are we doing in this area? How, how are we doing on victims, uh, on accountability for, for, for the English speaking? <laughs> <laughs> as we transitioned after Nuremberg and to, to today. I just wanted to, to read, this carries on with some research that I had done with uh, Sharif Bastioni on this. And I just want to read this for you. Since 19, between 1945 and 2013, there has been 253 distinct armed conflicts in which an estimated minimum of 7.8 million people have lost their lives. However, if it is estimated that if victims of repressive authoritarian state regimes in these conflicts are also included, the total may be as high as 101 million victims. This figure does not include those who lost their lives as a consequence of armed conflict or state repression. Their inclusion would increase the total to 202 million victims for this same period. During this period, 823 people have been brought to justice in international and regional courts. It tells me that we're not doing a great job. Uh, and the idea of finding uh, some type of structure, as we were talking about in this, the, the, the sum greater than its parts, uh, clearly requires us to, I think, look a bit different at, at how we move forward from this, from this state. And for me, a big emphasis is on national prosecution, building up domestic capacity to undertake uh, uh, accountability. Um, it is the hallmark, the center, perhaps to me the most important component of the Roman statute is the complementary principle. And yet, the complexity of doing that has, has, I think, haunted this court, the ICC, in a, in a pretty significant way. It's interesting enough, it's, it's not the first time, and this gets back to Stephen's points, too, about how this all emerged. I, I did not know this until I started researching this with the group, including Richard Goldstein. That, you know, in 1943, there was a it was a creation of the United Nations War Crimes Commission. Now, that was before the United Nations existed. And this was a, a commission that was created by the Allies to, in essence, bring to justice those that were committing the crimes during, the, during World War II. And it's fascinating to look at the history, because at, at the very heart of it was this concept of complementarity. They used these terms of, of inability and willingness words that came up in the Roman statute. But most importantly, in my opinion, they emphasized domestic prosecution, national prosecution. That was the, the foundation of this, this commission. So we, even during the war, we, we were seeing this emphasis on national prosecution. They did emphasize the need for an international court, 
uh, but it's, it's, the, it's the domestic national uh, emphasis. I think that in the future, nation states will be the accountability center or centers for international crimes. Uh, I think that's a combination of the struggle that the International Criminal Court right now is facing. I think there are major problems uh, at this point. Uh, and I think we're really looking at a degree of crisis, I think, unless we can get these other components together. Uh, Beth had mentioned universal jurisdiction that we're going to talk about later as well. But here, too, if you look at that as a component, that, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a concept that is being weakened in a dramatic way. In Europe, every single country in Europe has taken what was once a fairly a very strict kind of form, absolute form of universal jurisdiction, and they have weakened every single country now has put so many conditions on it uh, that I think it's unlikely that somebody like President Bush or Rumsfeld who would, if decided to go over and visit Europe, would actually be brought to justice because of these legislative changes that are occurring uh, that, to me, absolutely decimated this concept of universal jurisdiction, certainly in Europe. So, so you have a court that's weakened. You have a, a component of international justice of universal jurisdiction that is weakened and being weakened even further. And then you have national accountability centers or the responsibility of nation state. This is where I think there is hope uh, for building a consensus and providing support uh, for the countries that, can, that have the, the willingness uh, to undertake these, these trials and the international community creating mechanisms to, to help them accomplish that. And I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just say uh, the last point I want to make on that, because I know we're running out of time, is if you look at the work of the ICTY, if you look at the Yugoslav crisis, the Yugoslav war, during that war, would anyone have thought it possible that in Serbia you would have a Serbian war crimes chamber court conducting war crimes by Serbian judges with Serbian prosecutors against Serbs. No one who's ever had any involvement with the former Yugoslavia, and I lived there for many years, would have any inkling that this was possible. And yet that's what has happened. And it's happening now in Croatia, it's happening in other parts of the former Yugoslavia. Yes, there are challenges. It's, 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 it's not perfect, but what a remarkable achievement that has occurred for international justice on the domestic level. That, to me, is the model. And I'm heartened to know that if it can be done in the former Yugoslavia, uh, there's hope for it to be done in a number of other ways. Omar mentioned about, about uh, Libya and about the Gaddafi trials. Uh, I'll just say 60 seconds on that. Uh, we did undertake a major review of the El Sanusi uh, trials and the 22 cohorts that were brought to justice. Why? Because, uh, as you know, the ICC uh, uh, found that, it, that that case was inadmissible, and the, the reason was they felt that uh, Libya had the, the willingness and the ability to undertake these trials. Generally, the NGO community came out and was was critical, I mean, severely critical of the court. In essence, saying, you cannot possibly think that, you, that these 23 individuals are going to get a fair trial in a post-conflict, uh, or actually a current conflict arena like Libya. But the court made the decision that it, it was inadmissible, and therefore they were going to do it. I felt that, from the IBA's perspective, we should not necessarily jump on the the bandwagon, if you will, of NGOs condemning the process, because that's what complementarity is about. And so I thought we should undertake an objective assessment of the trials uh, as it was going on, and we did. It was a seven-month, really intensive process of interviewing, of getting documents, uh, that many of those documents are quite difficult to get a hold of, but we put together a very comprehensive data base 
to then assess whether or not we felt these trials were fair under international standards. Because remember, even though I promote domestic national trials, accountability, for accountability, they have to meet international standards of impartiality and fairness. That's the, that's the fundamental principle. So we reviewed those, that, all the, the, those trials. And we found aspects of the trials that did meet international standards of fairness, without question. And NGOs were not bringing that up. But overall, at the end, we found uh, the trial not to have met the, the standards of fairness and impartiality required by, the, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by law. And then three weeks ago, I sent in a letter to the Office of the Prosecutor to say, well, now that there's question about this whole issue, we, I would like to ask you to reconsider your decision on, on the inadmissibility position. Uh, because I thought that that was what the court should do. The court should be able to, to look at that and say, well, we got that wrong. And I got back a letter this week uh, saying that in the, in, in the OTP's view, uh, their decision was correct, and there's no new evidence to suggest otherwise. I thought that was striking, uh, uh, but it's going to be something I will continue to push now. This is just, this is for me, just the start, because it's important for the court to also deal with this whole issue of conflict. Thanks very much.